and then we can move on to our kind of free form discussion section. Um, so this is meant to be a, you know, kind of a group discussion. I'll moderate it and, you know, make sure everything is kept fairly civil, but I would like to take kind of a, a hands-off approach and use this time to, you know, let, let many different people talk. Um, I know Nir mentioned this earlier, but this is a great place for junior researchers to ask questions, uh, bring up ideas and, and learn more. Um, so keep that in mind. And I see that we have quite a few questions on our Google Doc. Um, the, the first three were put there by uh, our you know, coordinators of the conference, and maybe we can just, you know, kind of start there to get things rolling. But one one of the main questions that that I wanted to bring up was, you know, you have all these theories of of cloud crushing, shattering, turbulent mixing, and and thermal instability. And is there is there a smoking gun way to prove these theories correct? You know, is there an observation or a, a signature that we can use to to help us distinguish between these theories? Um, uh, there are many other questions on here. I think if if people would like to, um, if people have questions that they would like to ask, please, uh, you know, still use the raise your hand button, but this can be a bit more free form than uh, the Q&A sessions. Um, Todd, I see you have your hand raised, go for it. Just a quick comment that, um, you know, we, we have, have strong evidence for very hot gas uh, in the central regions of starburst galaxies that would be super virial gas, but we don't really understand the hot gas dynamics because we don't have very sensitive X-ray spectroscopy that resolves the hot gas um, dynamics as we normally would with other observations, at least for galaxies like was pointed out for M82 and others. So one way to assess the dynamical importance of the hot gas and to understand more about what the hot gas might be doing would be to actually understand the, the hot gas dynamics uh, by uh, resolved spectroscopy, like with new X-ray emissions and so on. Um, I just wanted to mention that because I think it's an important ingredient in almost everything that's being discussed, but there are very few observational constraints besides just the emission measure through the X-ray emitting medium, not velocities. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. But the even emission, right, sorry, can I speak? Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. So even the emission, you know, getting X-ray emission from normal Milky Way-like galaxies is extremely hard. Forget about the velocity, resolution, and uh, so on, right? Unlike galaxy clusters where you can really image the hot, you know, mass-containing phase. Only in, like, Milky Way, you know, there are some studies of X-rays you know, mapping of the CGM uh, in next rays, right? Is that correct, Tom? I mean, we see X-ray halos in starburst galaxies um, in emission, and we can measure emission lines, uh, and we can measure even abundances. Um, uh, you're right that we're limited if we go to, you know, galaxies that are that are more than some number of megaparsecs away, but um, for systems that we've spent a lot of time thinking about how the hot gas and cold gas interact and where we have the best constraints, systems like NGC 253, M82, some bigger starbursts, um, those um, are ones where I think we have a hope of directly resolving uh, the dynamics um, in, in the X-ray. So you're talking about the galaxy outflows. Right. You're really talking about the galactic outflows at you know 10 kpc scale, right. at larger scale, right? Thanks. Yeah, in smaller galaxies, I'm kind of excited about uh, dispersion measures because you know uh, cold gas can you know this is basically RMS fluctuations in, in electron column density, and you know cold gas can uh, provide significant column. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we also have a hand raised from uh, Arena. Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to comment, perhaps on behalf of Crescent collaboration, this is the next X-ray imaging and spectroscopy mission, that um, high resolution X-ray spectroscopy is coming, as you know, and studying dynamics of hot components in galaxies is one of the main key science goals. 
So we did uh, some preliminary estimates whether we can do it given the limited spatial resolution and given the relatively low effective area. It looks promising at this stage. Um, of course, it will be very hard to do specially resolved uh, observations, but at least covering the central brightest region will be possible. So we just need to wait perhaps a couple of years. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, Kartik, yeah, go for it. Uh, for Irina, who just spoke, a uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, point. What what, what uh, mission are you talking about, this X-ray spectroscopy? So this is, um, uh, this is X-ray imaging spectroscopy mission. This is kind of, you probably heard about Hitomi and Astrage. Uh, we successfully launched it, so there will be a um, follow-up mission, and it's been we've been working on it already actively for a couple of years. Um, things are going pretty much fine. What it will be exactly the same. Sorry again. What 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 velocity resolution do you expect to resolve? Uh, well, in terms of velocities, I can't tell you exact numbers, but velocities of a few tens kilometers per second, uh, well, it depends on the temperature of the gas, but basically five electron volts is resolution, which is a factor of 30 better than the resolution of existing X-ray observatories. Um, so we have a Crimson white paper published, probably I can um, just drop a link on it on our chat later. Um, we have simulations and you can see what kind of spectra we expect to get, including galaxies. Yes, yeah, if you're on the Slack channel, uh, please, you know, post a, a paper or anything relevant there because uh, the chat on Zoom will disappear in, you know, 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, we also, so there's a bunch of questions here on the Google Doc. Uh, I see that there's a number of questions for Drummond and Pratik, uh, and also one for Arena from Stephanie. Maybe since we just heard Arena speak, we can go to that question. Um, maybe Stephanie, do you want to do you want to ask it? Oh sure. So um, I was just thinking about your rho t diagram, where you kind of showed that you um, and you have uh, cooling and no cosmic rays. Um, until you run into a resolution problem, uh, everything falls kind of along the same pressure line. Um, and then when you uh, included cosmic rays, um, everything kind of fell along the same density. Um, and then things got a little messier when you included cosmic ray transport. And I was just wondering if there was kind of a, a way that I could think about where um, in your diagrams, I was seeing kind of an effect from cosmic ray transport and where I was seeing more of an effect as a resolution uh, issue. And, and if there was a, a way to kind of cleanly separate that. Yeah, well, actually for the cosmic ray runs that I showed, the cosmic ray pressure was substantial enough so that the cold gas clouds are actually resolved well by the simulations. Oh, okay, great. Cool, that's really interesting, thanks. Right. Uh, any other questions, um, I guess, before we, you know, we can always dip into the questions in the Google Doc. Um, yeah, so I see I see a number of questions uh, for Drummond. I don't know if Drummond is, is there and, and willing to answer a few of these. Um, Sure. Let's see. Maybe give us an update of what's been going on on the Google Doc. I see you've answered some of them. <laughs> uh, yeah. So gravity tends to stabilize Kelvin Helmholtz instability. How would this affect the fractal dimension of the mixing layer? Will it smoothen the mixing layer and therefore change the subsequent scaling relation for inflow velocity? Um, well, I responded that indeed gravity does suppress Kelvin Helmholtz instability, and I see there's a follow up I hadn't seen, so I'll just say exactly the context in which I was imagining it. Um, if you consider the, uh, you know, if my, my interface layer, if there was a vertical gravitational acceleration, then if that acceleration becomes large enough, 
then you can smooth, you can entirely suppress Kelvin Helmholtz. Um, so this is similar to if you have a strong magnetic field, you can entirely suppress Kelvin Helmholtz. And if you are not getting any um, Kelvin Helmholtz, you're not getting any turbulence, and therefore you're not getting any mixing, and therefore you're not getting any cooling. So yeah, I think uh, there's really, um, you know, it's all, it all comes down to this number, the Richardson's number, which is the ratio of buoyancy. So, you know, the importance of gravity relative to the shear strength. And so if your, your Richardson crosses this critical threshold of a quarter and gravity is strong enough, then you're suppressed. I think, you know, Nir, if he's still here, he can probably comment or maybe Daisuke could yeah. as well because they worked with um, a student, uh, the last name is Ang, I believe, who- um, Hanong. Yeah. Han Hanong, thank you, yeah. Uh, showed that without cooling, that indeed you do suppress mixing above a certain uh, degree of, you know, Richardson's number. And so, I don't know, Neil, maybe you want to comment on this. Sure. I mean, I, I think in, in some sense that's a geometrical dependent statement. And, and what we mean by gravity, if we're talking about self-gravity or some external gravitational acceleration. Um, the, the work that Drummond was referring to uh, led by a graduate student at Yale, Han, Han Ong, uh, we looked at what happens with a self-gravitating cylinder meant to represent the cosmic web filament that was basically feeding a massive galaxy through the circumgalactic medium. Uh, and assuming that the filament, so there's no cooling, so none of what the interesting phenomenology that we've been hearing about today was really valid, but um, at very low values of the line mass where you might naively expect self-gravity to be negligible compared to the thermal pressure. Uh, we nevertheless found that even though Kelvin Helmholtz was effective along the edges of the cylinder and the initial mixing occurred almost identical to the case with no gravity, the central regions uh, became stabilized by the buoyancy effect exactly as Drummond said when the Richardson number crossed that threshold of one quarter. Uh, of course, the really interesting thing was when you slightly increased the line mass, the whole thing became gravitationally unstable and uh, the filament fragmented into bound clumps, uh, which while this is a little off topic, this is related to one of the three questions that was raised in the Google Doc initially in terms of what regimes, you know, when, when, when we advertised this, this conference, we, we made very bold statements about we wanted uh, to, to discuss every possible astrophysical regime that contained multiphase gas. And of course, for many of us here, we're interested in certain galactic and intergalactic mediums where we can tend to safely ignore self-gravity. Uh, and I just wonder what people feel about, you know, if we try to apply these models to the multiphase structure in the uh, interstellar medium where self-gravity is extremely important. Do we expect any of the really interesting stuff that we've been doing here to be relevant or will self-gravity just be the completely dominated over all of the phenomenology? Uh, I don't know. What do, what do, what do people think about that? Uh, I see Drummond's hand raised. Uh, that was unrelated. Oh, okay. I'll lower it. <laughs> uh, well, I can I can say something. I don't know. The you know the interstellar medium. Uh, you know, it is a multi-phase medium. Undoubtedly, there is the, the cold neutral medium and the warm atomic medium. And I think a lot of the same thermal instability processes we're talking about act in the presence of, you know, the importance of self-gravity. I think the thing is, what will happen is this additional force, which will really kick in once the cold cloud has, has fully formed. Um, so I do think there will still be a lot of the same physics. I don't think self-gravity will wipe everything out, but it is definitely an additional wrinkle. Um, I'm frantically looking for some ISM specialist for me to just like pick on and call, but. Well, wait, wait till tomorrow that we're, we'll have some ISM stuff tomorrow. Yeah, we'll right. have some talks tomorrow that are very relevant. Right, so, you know. I, I think just... thing or, or Mordecai or someone. Yeah, I can sort of say something about the crashing problem. Oh, sorry. Uh, should I speak? This, this is pretty here. Uh, go for it. I, I can't see everyone, so just go so, ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, sorry on that. So the original cloud pressure problem 
was sort of done for the ISM, right? So it's, you know, you're really getting back to it, but ISM has real motivation for similar uh, type of physics regime. And as Raman said, there is, you know, thermal instability, the three phase medium, you know, almost similar to uh, the CGM hot phase and the atomic phase and the cold CO, you know, in galaxy cluster, the cold phase. So a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, cross links between these areas for sure. And also the ISM people say that, you know, turbulence brings in a lot of gas in the formerly thermally unstable region. And that's exactly this broad uh, temperature distribution and differential emission measure PDFs show us. So, you know, we're talking about very, very similar uh, physics, right? Yeah, I see uh, Stephanie's hand raised, so maybe she can uh, comment on some of this in the ISM. Uh, go for it. Yeah, so um, I actually wasn't planning on showing too much about self-gravity tomorrow, but um, so we have done a cloud um, cloud crushing study similar to what you talked about today um, where we wanted to understand if molecules can form and survive in galactic outflows so this uh, is work by Philip Gershides and we haven't uh, gotten around to publishing it yet there we see that uh, self-gravity is important for the survival of the clumps um, but it is a slightly different regime so we are um, starting with a colder colder clump right so um yeah and i mean for the for the um general for the ism i mean it's also it's the weight of the disc overall together with the self gravity which which kind of holds molecular clouds together um but in addition to that they are also pushed by supernovae so it's a bit more complicated so i will talk about that tomorrow yeah. So, Great. I mean, no. really self-gravitating structures, sometimes we only find on tiny scales. Um, so um, these would be like cold and dense anyway already. So not related then to the phase transition, really. All right. Yeah, I see, Drummond, you have your hand raised again. Yeah, I'm going to change gears a little bit, if that's all right with everyone. I wanted to ask a question to Max after looking at one of Irina's movies. Um, Irina showed these clouds forming in situ in the rapidly cooling thermal instability case. And one thing that I noticed after, after listening to your talk is those clouds were coagulating, uh, which I think is pretty neat in light of what you were showing. And, and I was, I guess I was wondering if you could say a little bit about, um, the, I mean, maybe you already do, and I just need to look through it. But what in, in that final movie you showed with the turbulent box with the cold cloud, you say the cold cloud uh, is 50 times larger than the critical radius. What velocity did you use to calculate that critical radius? Is that due to the pulsations or is that due to the turbulent shear velocity due to what you're driving, trying to figure out how to relate that to Irina's coagulation? Max, if you're talking, I at least can't hear you. Uh, noise? Just okay. hear a drum beat coming out of. Can you hear now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So it's it's with respect to the the uh, turbulent velocity of the medium as I answer to switching. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, the correlation in what Irina has been showing is, is probably very strong. I mean, similar to the, the simulations I showed, uh, you know, of like test stuff. Uh, but I mean, there we didn't have any turbulence, right? I mean, in the stuff I showed later, then turbulence drives the part. And um, yeah, it's kind of a game ruiner for turbulence, uh, for correlation, it seems. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Sushin, you have a, a question or comment? Uh, yes, I have a comment or a question, uh, message to everyone. So I'd like to bring the topic back to the main thing about this uh, conference. 
that is the mild phase gas, right? So I think uh, about the phase of full phase, uh, we actually do not quite know well about what is the mild phase gas in CGM. So as uh, Irina has mentioned, uh, and also as we have found in the fire fuel simulations with copper uh, if the non pressure is really important, then it could change the status, the thermal status of the cool phase. So if there's no thermal pressure, or thermal pressure is not important, so the cool phase must be in pressure confinement, right? So the cloud must be stay in the state, in a state of very small, very dense clumps. And in order to match observation, you need to get a very large cold fraction. Then cool phase must maintain you know, very small volume thin factor. But with uh, non-thermal pressure support, and if it is dominant, we find that the, uh, the cloud will not be in the thermal pressure equilibrium. Then cool phase can be very diffuse, very large, and very volume thin. At the same time, with a very large uh, cold fraction. So I'm just wondering, what is the real state of the thermal pressure? Uh, so regarding the thermal pressure of the cool phase. So what is the real state of the cool phase? Is that uh, in a pressure confinement, or it is very diffuse, uh, very volumefully? And is there a way we can tap the scenario for observations? For example, we can have some uh, uh, FRB observations. So we can tell what is the real status of the multi-phase gas in the situation. In the CGM. So that is what I'm wondering for a while. Um, yeah, I that's a good. Uh, would anyone like to comment on that? Oh, I see Max, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an observer, but I feel uh, Joe Hanab is not here, I guess, but I, I should answer and like he would say something like, you know, that, you know, the, the number density and the, the infer from um, ionization modeling and the column density you're referring to, that's one of any observations, right? And so he would say, you know, you have quasar, quasar sight lines, you have um, emission maps of, you know, the, the slag nebula and other things, and you have kinematic tracers such as magnesium 2 from Churchill and all of our others that uh, that point towards this lower volume filling fraction picture. But please correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm just understood. Cool, anyone else? I don't see any current hand raise. Oh, I I can't up, raise okay. I can't raise oh. my hand because I'm a host, right? Um, right go for it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I guess one question I had. I mean, we're talking about measuring all of these very hard to measure gas phases, which of course we should try and you know push uh, what we can do on that front. But um, are amongst all of these models that people are working on, though, is there are there just like simple diagnostics like the distribution of cloud sizes, the shape of clouds relative to their velocity, you know, like, are there just like simple things that we could even just do by like high resolution H1 mapping, like of, of like nearby <laughs> CGI? I mean, I'm not an observer, but I, I guess, um, you know, is, do these models make distinct predictions for some of these just simple things? And I don't know the answer. Yeah, Cameron, go for it. So yes and no. Um, in terms of cloud sizes, uh, I, I think there are a number of papers that look at this a little bit. I know my paper from last year has a plot that shows cloud size with the resolution. My paper was on increasing, like uh, what Freak is going to talk about tomorrow and what the Foggy Group has also done. My paper increases the resolution throughout the halo and sees what impact increasing the resolution has on the behavior and the dynamics of the CGM. And uh, the result, at least that I found, is that we're at the resolution limit. And as you increase the resolution and go to finer scales, you have cloud sizes that go to smaller scales. But it's not converged at all. So I think I don't foresee that being 
something that we can well i mean i guess with the cosmic ray runs that would give a different value and that might be something that we could probe through other stuff but for the most part i think with the observations there aren't hard and fast values that that people have been able to constrain there was some work by kate rubin a couple of years ago that put constraints on magnesium two size scales cloud size scales but it's hard it's yeah hard. It's small. I, because it just sort of seems like some of the questions is like what what is the pressure that is confining you know dense gas and this like layer this like cooling layer and the topology of, or the shape of the cooling layer and um, like, can we observe, observe that cooling layer, right? Like, that seems to be where a lot of the interesting physics is happening. And so, like, directly observing that, I don't know how to do that or what that even means, but I, yeah, I guess it's all hard, so I don't know. Um. Um, Kartik, go for it. Hi, uh, about the observations of these cool clouds. Uh, I know that there are some observations in our galaxy, like uh, in H1, for example, towards the galactic center, where uh, this uh, this is uh, some work from Andrew Fox, uh, Ramon Bortolai's group, uh, finding H1 emission, uh, you know, detecting these clouds in the H1 emission away from the galactic center uh, upwards. So they're suspecting this is uh, probably uh, like entrained uh, clouds in the Milky Way wind. So maybe they're maybe some kind of hint from those observations. Um, what is the nature of this? Uh, no? how, how well can we observe these clouds? Uh, Max. Is your hand raised? Yeah, I, I mean, I enjoy this uh, observation and discussion, but I think um, we are mainly viewers here. So I feel, I mean, I <laughs> feel that. So I want to bring maybe a little bit back to theory and, and ask Draman the question, like well, the question of his title essentially. So, you know, I mean, in terms of mass growth, very nice work you showed why it's converged and, you know, that actually the resolution requirement are not, not that uh, stringent or not that crazy maybe, right? But on the other hand, um, we want to compare to observations at the end of a day, right? So, so is, is there really, is it going to be CST cool or the field length or whatever that, that we need to resolve in order to get O6, right? And so on. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, I don't, <laughs> I mean, in short, yes. Although, you know, in more detail, I think it remains to be seen when we include additional processes, you know, Irina showed really clearly that the phase structure depend, you know, will change, and so did Su Ching in the in the fire stimulations with cosmic rays. The phase structure will really depend on the additional physical processes you include. So, cosmic rays or magnetic fields could significantly alter the overall phase structure. I mean, I do think that if if you were to imagine a universe without these additional processes, and you wanted to make a detailed comparison to the observations, you would genuinely need to resolve the sound speed or the, the, the cooling length. Um, but of course we don't live in that universe. And so we may be saved. The clouds might be, or the, you know, the detailed phase structure might be uh, easier to resolve, but it looks like there's a bunch of other people who have thoughts on that. Um, I mean, can I, I mean, this is, I mean, perhaps in the same vein, if not exactly the same question, maybe broaden it up a bit. If we are interested in making predictions for I mean, like oxygen six or, or any other detailed ion in the mixing layer, uh, how much should we all be worried about non-equilibrium cooling and non-equilibrium ionization effects in our simulations? I mean, I think I think I don't we, think any of us have been. <laughs> no, every time I talk about this at the CCA, Emil Sternberg asked me that same question. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think it's a question of the relative time scales, and it, it's a really good thing to look at. So, so indeed, maybe maybe to get the hydrodynamics right, you need to resolve CST cool, but then non-equilibrium cooling will do even more. So, so I'm, I'm not quite sure. We'd have to look at the time scales to really to really make a concrete statement about this. So all sorts of hands just went up. Um, 
I believe we're out of technically out of time. Uh, Craig, if you're out there and want to say whether we should continue or not, please please do. Uh, yeah, I think that's up to you. We can continue for a little bit longer if you want. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's let's do a few more minutes. Um, and you know, especially for people who haven't asked questions yet, let's uh, let's try to prioritize prioritize that. Um, so I see. Uh, I see Phil. You can go ahead. So I actually just had a quick question following up on this point about non-equilibrium cooling in chemistry. Uh, you know, what exactly? You know, this, that can mean a lot of different things. So I'm not sure what you're even specifically referring to. I mean, there are models that. Plenty of the cooling simulations technically have non-equilibrium cooling in chemistry. Are you thinking, I know there's been, for example, papers about if you have like flickering X-ray source from an AGN that can give you, you know, non-equilibrium ionization dynamics. Is that what you're thinking about? Or I'm just curious a little more what you, if you could elaborate, what are the effects driving it that you're worried about or, or think we should be worried about? Yeah, I, I guess just within the mixing layers, so, you know, people are trying to make predictions for the detailed ionization states of, you know, oxygen 6 to oxygen 4 or, or things of that nature. And I don't know that the mixing time scales and subsequent cooling time scales, how they compare to the ionization equilibrium uh, times within that mixing layer. So for taking the next step forward and really trying to make very detailed predictions for um, absorption line spectroscopy and what within the, 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 the sharing layers or the mixing layers, are we in a position to do that? Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I think, and I think I understand. I just, yeah. And I think, I think a difference here may also be some of the codes do non-equilibrium ionization on the fly, although some of them don't follow these metal ions. But I think if I, under, you know, a lot of the post-processing stuff that people are using to make predictions from this don't, you know, they're they're just taking the the, the equilibrium rates, either photo or collisional. Is that is that correct? Fair to the people who are doing this? I, I just want to make sure I understand what people are doing. Basically, is what I'm trying to get at. Yes. Well, uh, we have not yet heard from Greg. Uh, go for it, Greg. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple of comment and, and maybe a, a rhetorical question. The, um, I, I'm on the resolving for the, the phase structure. Actually, I'm slightly more, I, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said, but I'm slightly more optimistic than Drummond's answer. I think it may depend on which ions you're after, because if you're after ions which have a higher temperature, um, then they're, they're in the, as, as, as John showed, I think the the part of the phase structure which is um, changes with resolution is actually going to be quite concentrated down to this sort of lower mid to low temperature region. And so if you're after the higher temperatures, you may um, get a, a better, it may be easier to resolve. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to say was I, I think this point about um, the non-equilibrium um, um, metal lines uh, is, is really quite important. Um, and uh, both in terms of the time scale, but also because you might be in very close proximity to very high temperature gas. So for example, if you're a cold cloud in a hot X-ray cluster, and there might be high energy electrons or, or cosmic rays, which are influencing your, um, the state of your, your, your metal line excitations. Um, and that may influence the, the both the absorption line and the emission line processes, because I think that's one of the great observational um, tools that we're going to get more and more of is, is simultaneous uh, absorption and emission line information, which will allow us to disentangle the phase structure. Um, but but that comes coming with that comes with a, a, a enormous amount of machinery to compute. And so here's my sort of my question: Are people developing Tools. I mean, there are some calculations out there um, which look at the um, this non-equilibrium metal line structure, um, but it's it's uh, you know it's a lot of fr it's a big framework. So it would be great to have open source tools that um, 
could be combined with, with lots of the beautiful simulations that we saw today to make predictions. All right, so there's a, there's a few more hands raised. Maybe we can just do those and then we'll then we'll call it a day. So on my end, I see Pang, Kristoff, and Kartik. So let's start with Pang. Uh, yeah, just very quick. Uh, so for the non-equilibrium uh, mixing layers, uh, Scorching uh, did it with, um, with just non-equilibrium chemistry for the metal ions. But I think what's uh, interesting and I think so in that case, there's an enhancement in column densities, but it's a factor of two effect. So, you know, the recombination time is longer. But uh, I think what's interesting and has not been done is non-equilibrium cooling, as far as I know. That means folding in these different ionization states and putting it into the cooling function on the fly. Cool, uh, go for it, Christoph. Yeah. I think it's great to look at the observables, but I would be a little bit cautionary about our knowledge of the physical processes. For instance, the field length was mentioned. However, this assumes that electrons are, thermal electrons are diffusing along magnetic field lines. Now, it turns out that Whistler waves scatter the electrons in their, to their frame, which reduces the uh, effective speed with which electrons can be transported to something like the phase speed over the plasma beta factor, so factor of 100 or so lower. And there are not a, plasma, a lot of other plasma effects we haven't really taken seriously into account. So I think there will be some surprises along the way. And, and it's great to compare observables, but I don't think we have the full physical picture you know, to our disposal that, that we can really claim we have done the problem. And, and I think there will be some surprises coming up. Uh, Kartik, go for it. Right, so, uh, continuing the non-equilibrium thing, uh, so uh, I had some recent exposure to the non-equilibrium physics and simulations. And uh, the thing is that uh, about the dynamics affecting uh, the dynamics, so non-equilibrium cooling doesn't seem to like uh, really affecting the dynamics in general in uh, hydrodynamic simulations, but uh, considering the column densities, they can be really uh, affecting, like what do you uh, observe from a simple photoequilibrium or a collisional equilibrium ones. Uh, so I think, uh, again, depending on, as Greg pointed out, depending on the uh, uh, which ions you look at, for example, oxygen 6 may not uh, be that different, maybe, maybe by factor of 2 to 3, but some of the other ions like uh, cooler, uh, lower ionization states uh, may be even uh, affected by an order of magnitude or so. So that needs to be calculated. And uh, if like, as another advertisement, if people are looking for free source for calculating this non-equilibrium ionization dynamics along with cooling, um, like I have posted some um, you know, papers which actually lead you to use some tools in your code if you want to. Yeah, we have we have a few more minutes, so we have the, the okay to go for a few more minutes. And I know uh, Greg posed a good question about computational tools. Um, maybe if anyone would like to comment uh, on that question, uh, this is this would be a good time to do it. Or if there's any other comments on on anything else we've talked about during this session, uh, this this is your last chance, I suppose. All right, oh, Cameron, thank you, go for it. Yeah, so was the, correct me if I'm wrong, or, or perhaps Greg can clarify. So the question was, are there computational tools for being able to do processing of the data sets uh, that in, uh, to make synthetic observations, including the effects of non-equilibrium physics? Is that the, the main? Yes, well, as, as as you have contributed uh, tools to do the the equilibrium uh, post processing calculation, which is which is great. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, um, but the non equilibrium part of that, um, 
Uh, so you know, there's there's uh, there's a bunch of works in the in the paper which have 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 done this, and and I think Peng's point about including the um, uh, including the cooling aspect on the fly uh, is 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 important. So yeah, so it's that part which I'm I'm talking. About. Yeah, any any other comments? All right, well, I don't see anything on my end. Um, and I know we've gone quite a bit over time. So why don't we why don't we finish for the day? Uh, thank you all for the, the great discussion this last uh, 45 minutes or so. And if, if you want to continue the discussion, you can always go on the Slack channel and uh, do direct messages to you know individuals or groups. Um, please post relevant papers, plots. Uh, keep the discussion going for the next uh, day and a half. Or I guess we have the Slack channel for I think until the the 21st or 22nd. Um, so yeah, keep that in mind. Um, and thank you all for thank you all for coming today. Thank you to all the speakers as well. And, uh, yeah, the talks were great. Thank you. Yeah. And, we'll and thanks to all the organizers. Organizers. <laughs> thanks. Uh, tomorrow. Yes, tomorrow we will reconvene. Um, so you see you again. Uh, okay. Bye. Bye.